A war that has dragged on for two years and is showing no signs of coming to an end. Months of high inflation, public spending cuts, a recession in Germany. The headline news about the European economy has not been good in recent times. But are things really as bad as they seem? To talk about this, I'm joined by investor and author Ruchir Sharma. Ruchir, you wrote a very interesting article for the FT recently outlining your predictions for this year. And one of them was that Europe was going to stage a comeback. What led you to draw that conclusion? Well, one to start with is expectations. Um, I carry out an annual list of the top 10 trends that are likely to define the year. At the beginning of 2023 on that list, one of my uh, 10 predictions was that Japan would stage a comeback because once again, expectations were very low. There were some reforms which were going on in Japan to improve corporate governance, to improve shareholder value, and in general, uh, to try and lift economic growth. And that's what really transpired in 2023. In this year's top 10 predictions of mine, my point is that while I don't expect the European economy to perform any miracles, expectations are very low. Uh, people just can't seem to talk anything good about Europe, and for good reason, because you, the European economy has gone through, as you outlined, a series of crises, really, since 2008, uh, it has faced many crises uh, every couple of years. And my point is that expectations are very low, but that's not enough. It's not just about low expectations. Some of the fundamentals may be turning around for Europe in terms of at least the specific shocks that hit the economy over the last couple of years. One is the big uh, energy shock, which led to inflation spiking to 10, 11 percent. That's now back down to close to 2%. That's a huge fall that's taken place. Similarly, if you look at what's happening to wages in Europe, um, in inflation-adjusted terms, real wage growth in Europe is currently at a 30-year high or something. So there's a lot of consumer spending power which is out there in Europe. And the other thing which we forget is this, which is that unlike the Americans, the Europeans saved a lot of the windfall from the pandemic, which is that a lot of stimulus was given and the consumers in Europe ended up saving a bulk of it, whereas in Europe, uh, in America, at least, the, they went and spent a lot of it. In Europe, they ended up saving a lot of it. Uh, and that shows up in much higher savings rates. And the third point, which I, if I can make here, is that in America, a lot of the consumers and corporates borrowed uh, at a fixed rate and in a very long-term way. In Europe, a lot of the borrowing in contrast was done at floating rates. And so Europe has felt the impact of higher interest rates much more than America, because in America, it's at fixed rates, so it'll slowly over time make its way through. But in Europe, the shock from high interest rates was much more sudden. So I think a lot of the bad news is factored into Europe. And also, there are some signs of a positive turn, at least for the European consumer, given the fact that the shock of uh, high energy prices is now faded and wage growth uh, in inflation-adjusted terms is significantly positive. I think that's really interesting because, as you've outlined, there are a lot of reasons why Europeans maybe should be spending more now. You know, inflation is under control, wages are rising, the energy crisis um, has, has abated somewhat. But I'm wondering, do you think they actually will, you know, or will they just squirrel their money away given how much uncertainty there still is, especially geopolitically? Well, I don't say, I won't say the right word is squirrel, but. But yes, the right word may be that they keep on saving and they don't spend any of it. Because as I said, the savings rate in Europe today is significantly higher than that of uh, America. And a lot of that may be precautionary savings for the reasons you mentioned, that they've suffered so many shocks that they are much more inclined to save the money than to go out and spend it. So I think that's a very legitimate argument uh, to make. But as I said, the pessimism is very intense in Europe. Uh, there are many good reasons for it, including the fact that Europe lags America significantly on the tech front. Uh, and we're seeing it even in the productivity numbers and the demographic numbers. So the negative case for Europe is very easy to make and something which I've also been making for many years, 
which is that the government intervention in Europe tends to be much more productivity uh, is significantly lower, especially in the last five to seven years. Uh, the demographics are far inferior to that of America. And so, therefore, the gap between the European and the American economy has widened significantly. Uh, it's been widening really since 2007, 2008. And it's also partly driven by the exchange rate, uh, which is that the euro has depreciated significantly against the U.S. dollar. But that could be one good reason, which is that uh, European exports are now much more competitive than, let's say, in America, because the dollar looks so very uh, expensive. And the last point which I may mention here is that America's growth has also been flattered by a very high amount of fiscal spending. So if you look at America's budget deficit today, it is close to 6% of GDP. Europe is far lower. Uh, so in general today, Europe's indebtedness uh, is significantly lower, at least at the government level, compared to that of America. And the very heavy level of government spending and fiscal stimulus in America has, uh, I think, artificially boosted growth to far above what the underlying trend is. I want to pick up on a couple of the points you just made there. And one of them was about productivity, because as you said, if you compare European workers to their US counterparts, they are less productive, partly because they take more holidays, they're more likely to work part time and to retire earlier. Now, getting people to work more and longer is a hard sell. But I wonder what you think could be done to make European businesses more productive and more agile. Is it time to lower interest rates? Well, I think that lowering interest rates is not a way to boost productivity. Uh, clearly, in the zero interest rate regime of the 2010s, there was no appreciable boost to productivity. In fact, I have a new book coming out this June on what went wrong with capitalism, where I make the point that this easy money, low interest rate regime, if anything, has lowered productivity by misallocating capital rather than boosting productivity. And this is not just in Europe, in America as well. So lowering interest rates is not the solution here to boost productivity. Yes, I think that changing uh, the regulatory regime, uh, having less government, uh, allowing the private sector to function more independently, these are some of the factors which may help boost productivity apart from what's happening on the technology front. The fact that Europe is dominated, if you look at the top European companies, they're dominated by uh, luxury firms uh, and a bit of pharma companies. But in America, the domination is much more because of technology. So what's really boosted the American economy over the last decade or so is the fact that there's been so much focus on technology. It's been the decade of technology and America clearly has a lead over Europe on that front. So doing something more to improve the technological ecosystem is another factor. So I think that these are some of the factors that will boost productivity rather than just lowering interest rates, because clearly the zero interest rate or even the negative interest rate regime of the 2010s had a negative impact on productivity, not a positive one, because of the misallocation of capital that took place at such low interest rates. That is a really interesting point. And you also touched upon that huge level of debt in the US and how that could potentially jeopardize the power of the dollar. I guess I have a kind of a two part question on that for you. The first is how realistic a worry you think the prospect of US debt becoming unsustainable is. And then I'm wondering as well what role the euro could play in a world that is perhaps on the path towards de-dollarization. Yeah, I think that there are, uh, what's, so as far as America is concerned, clearly the debt path is unsustainable because they are forecast to run a budget deficit of 6% of GDP for the, not just this year or next year, but the foreseeable future. And that's not even for uh, accounting for the fact that you may get a recession somewhere in the middle, which will lead to a further widening of the deficit because of more automatic spending and lower tax revenue. So the path that America is on fiscally is clearly unsustainable. It just is a question of when will it really come to hit America rather than if. Uh, and that when is very hard to predict because America has the world's reserve currency, its ability to borrow is incredible. And there's so much hype that in America about AI and tech that foreigners are quite willing to fund America's uh, 
expensive habits. So therefore, it's able to sustain a current account deficit of 3 to 4 percent of GDP for a long time. But still, if you keep running twin deficits, which is your budget deficit plus current account deficit of close to 10 percent of GDP when you combine them, that is a completely unsustainable part. So it's a question of when, not if, but obviously it's very hard to predict uh, as to when exactly that will happen. Regarding de-dollarization, one of the big issues as to why we've had de-dollarization or some trend towards that is because of the kind of sanctions that America has been imposing. Uh, because even as far as Russia is concerned, it may have been the morally right thing to do uh, to throw Russia off the dollar standard that we currently are on. Uh, but it clearly sort of has a negative effect because a lot of countries around the world, not just Russia, but a lot of countries around the world, including India, Brazil, they all begin to think that uh, we never want to be in a position of being so dependent on the US dollar. The problem is that the EU has also been as active as America almost in imposing sanctions. Uh, and so a lot of people don't trust the euro either if they don't trust the dollar, given the sanctions which are imposed, because a lot of these countries do not want to be at the mercy uh, of either the dollar or even the euro if they could face sanctions and uh, financial sanctions in particular. Of course, the other problem euro has had in general is there's always been this lingering question that uh, will something happen to break it up? Uh, in the mid-2010s, we had the Greek crisis. It's always that little sort of concern which remains. And so therefore, if you look at the activity of central banks, they are buying gold in a very big way. Uh, if you look at what some of the other millennials are doing here in America, they're buying Bitcoin in a big way, and they all say it's an alternative to the dollar. So I think that it's very hard for the euro to really supplant the dollar as such. And the trend of de-dollarization, which is playing out, is leading to two trends. One of people buying more gold, Bitcoin kind of things, which are alternatives to the uh, fiat system in a way. And the other thing which is happening is that bilateral trade has gone up a lot. So the only thing which Europe can do in this regard is one, uh, in terms of uh, just hanging together, which I think is happening. And the second thing is, I think, have a more pro-growth kind of policy environment that we discussed. Because in the absence of a pro-growth environment, people aren't going to look at Europe very positively. So there may be, as I said, that there is a case for some cyclical optimism on for Europe just because things are so negative. But on a secular basis, given the demographics in Europe and the overall regulatory and very heavy hand of the government, it's hard to see as to what leads to a secular growth uplift for euro. When it comes to the sanctions, though, was there any alternative? I mean, of course, you mentioned on one that there is the moral question, but is there a way that the US and the EU could have imposed sanctions in a way that would have perhaps backfired less? Is, is that a correct way to describe what you're saying, that the, the sanctions have backfired on an economic level? Well, backfire may be a very strong word as yet, but yeah, I do feel that it's had this clear uh, consequence, which is the fact that a lot of governments around the world were shaken by the way the sanctions were imposed because for the first time, uh, what happened here was that these were very strong financial sanctions which were imposed on Russia. Uh, so it, it led to a lot of governments getting worried that... Uh, what if it happens to them one day? Uh, you know, what if such sanctions, you know, their reserves are seized or something like that happens one day? So I think that that is something which worries a lot of governments. So I don't know what's the better or the right thing to do, but it's a, if you look at it, the sanctions regime has just crept up that the number of countries in the world which face sanctions today, uh, you know, is I think 30 or something by... Uh, America and the European Union. And that number has gone up considerably over the last few years. So it's just that more and more sanctions are being used and uh, by Western nations led by the US. And there are a lot of countries in the developing world which are very concerned by this development. And so therefore want to find alternatives. And the problem is that all these things play out very slowly. So there is no visible consequence. Uh, a lot of the American elite uh, you know, can turn around today and say, so what's the big deal we impose sanctions on Russia? Where is the negative effect? We are still being able to fund our budget deficit. Foreigners are still buying our 
tech stocks, and they're all mesmerized by the AI boom here. Where is the negative effect? And my point is that these things play out slowly, gradually, over time, and that process can be seen, as I said, if you look at central bank purchases of gold, where the price of gold is way higher than what uh, the underlying fundamentals should dictate. So I think that that's really what's going on out here. It's playing out slowly, but there's no immediate effect. And because there's no immediate effect, um, the sanctions regime is likely to keep continuing. I think what happened in Ukraine as well has really made Western powers reevaluate all of their relationships and dependencies, including, of course, with China. And we saw last year that German companies made record investments in the U.S., driven, of course, as well by the Inflation Reduction Act and the subsidies offered there. Where else do you see European investment away from China heading? Well, I think, you know, there are lots of, I mean, that's a trend we are seeing that uh, there are lots of emerging markets out there which have the potential. And I think that once again here, American companies have been much more swift and flexible in shifting their production base, not shifting, at least incrementally uh, putting their production facilities in other countries. So clearly, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, that corridor has benefited a lot. Uh, from the anywhere but China policy that global multinationals seem to be following now. Indonesia, India, even Thailand, Mexico. And then, of course, in Europe, the big advantage is Eastern Europe uh, in terms of that you've got countries right at the doorstep led by Poland, which are very attractive outsourcing, manufacturing destinations. And these are all countries that seem to have benefited. When we talk about Europe, I don't think we talk enough about what's happening on the Eastern European side. Even countries like Greece, uh, although it's got nothing to do with uh, China, but the fact that it's been really the poster child of a big comeback. Uh, the Greek economy has staged an amazing comeback from the depths of the crisis uh, a decade ago. So Greece is doing very well, but even Poland and uh, Hungary and those countries in that region are doing relatively uh, well now uh, after having suffered an inflation shock, obviously. But if you look at the flows of FDI and where people can go but China, I think there are lots of interesting places around the world. Uh, and we are seeing in Southeast Asia, uh, places such as India, Mexico and Eastern Europe, all beneficiaries of this trend of anywhere but China that global multinationals seem to be following. OK, now we know this is a really important election year. Almost half of the world is going to vote. The European Parliament elections aren't getting quite as much attention as, say, the US or Indian ones. But I'm wondering if you have any predictions for how the outcome could shape economic policy in the bloc, especially if, as expected, we see more populist parties coming into power. Well, one of the top 10 trends that I wrote about uh, for the Financial Times that you referred to at the top of your programme um, was that we're likely to see a big backlash develop. It's already been developing, but play itself out against immigration. Because if you look at what happened last year, 2023, it was a record year for immigration. A lot of immigrant flows took place in places such as America, even in UK and other places in Western Europe, that you had a record amount of immigration, partly because the labor markets were very tight partly because it was a catch-up after the uh, COVID lockdowns. Uh, and I think that we saw like a big influx of immigrants. Uh, now, that may have helped economically in a few ways, because having a large immigrant inflow when the labor markets are very tight is uh, good to ease labor market uh, pressures. Is You need more people when like to work as well, given how low unemployment rates are in many parts of the world. Uh, but the downside is that politically, uh, it leads to the social fabric of various countries being stretched. Uh, and I think that we are seeing a backlash. In America, it's obviously a very big issue. And one of the explanatory factors for President Biden's uh, record low approval ratings. But even in Europe, that's given rise to a lot of the populist far-right parties uh, in terms of how well that they are doing. Because... Uh, there is a political tension uh, for uh, having so many immigrants. So as I argue that, uh, 
having a strong immigration flow is possibly good economics, but bad politics. Uh, and the far-right parties are obviously being able to exploit that. Uh, and that's a trend that we have seen across much of the Western world. How do you think governments should make the economic case for immigration? It's very difficult to do, but I think that in terms of making... The case is an economic one, which is that labor markets are very tight. Uh, it is... Uh, you need people to augment the labor markets. Uh, I think that... But it's a... You know, like, to make it appear that it's reasonable and fair and it's not about supporting illegal immigrants, I think that's the only way to do it. Uh, or whether you... Uh, you know, I think that it's one of those things where, as I said, that it's very difficult to make a good economic case because this is uh, a good political case, rather, because, it, you know, these really sort of your... Uh, a lot of the people, a lot of the populist parties are pandering to the baser instincts of human beings by making it look as to how disruptive this trend is of uh, these people coming here. And the argument is so intuitively popular, which is that it's good economics to keep the labor markets uh, flowing, to get fresh talent in, to uh, not have very strong wage increases. But for the average worker in some of these countries, uh, you know, their argument is the fact that, yeah, we want higher wages, even if it leads to higher inflation, who cares? But, you know, we want higher wages. And also the fact that we don't want the social fabric of our countries to be disturbed. So therefore, it's something which I think that uh, has to be managed in a very delicate way, because to make the populist case uh, against immigration is very easy. The economic case is much more uh, wonky, nerdy, to make. Speaking of delicate balancing acts, Europe, of course, also has the transatlantic relationship to contend with. Given what Trump did in his last term with tariffs and his warnings about withdrawing military support for countries that don't meet their NATO spending targets, how should European policymakers prepare for the prospect of his re-election? I think it's very hard to prepare just because we just don't know as to what exactly he'll do once He's in office. Uh, he is very transactional. And I think a lot of European countries will be thinking that, what do you do to make a deal with Trump? Which is that, what do you give him in return uh, so that he feels as if he's won a deal? Uh, I think that's just how he tends to operate. But the other sort of factor I'll say here is, in general, I think that Europe has to think about uh, less American leadership on the global stage, uh, because uh, there are a lot of Americans who don't have an appetite for that. They don't have an appetite for spending in, uh, outside when they think that they're not getting a great life back at home. Why should we be spending all this money outside? So I think the general trend should be one where you expect American leadership to be less present and less supportive. So that's the, over, that's the general trend in place. Uh, but as I said, with Trump in particular... I think that they have to figure out that, OK, what do you give to make him feel as if he's winning something so that we can keep the big uh, gains that we have in place? Uh, it's, it's a very transactional relationship. And so uh, but it's very hard to prepare for it. First, the elections are very close call. And then, as I said, that even when he comes to power, it's so... Uh, and this happens, I think, with many countries, in particular with populist leaders, that what they say when they're out of power and what they do when they're in power can often be very different. Uh, and I think in Trump's case, if he sees a good deal, he'll take that and sell that as a winning strategy um, rather than just have a very strong ideological pursuit of anything through his entire term. So psychology is a big part of this. Finally, we talk a lot about European weaknesses like innovation, excessive bureaucracy and so on. But maybe I could ask you, where do you think Europe's resilience lies? Yeah, so I think that one, as I said, that the general at the government level, especially compared to countries such as America, the indebtedness, the budget deficits, there's a lot more fiscal discipline that, uh, in Europe. So that... So if the attention does turn in America to budget deficits and how large they are, I think that Europe will end up looking a lot better. And then, of course, there are pockets of strength in Europe. Uh, 
the one country I've spoken, you know, even though it's going through a bit of a slowdown now, but in general, I think is a model for the world even, uh, is like Switzerland. It's a country that's been able to balance it correctly in terms of how do you balance centralization versus decentralization? How do you balance in terms of how much government spending you do and uh, how, how much taxes you impose without driving away a lot of the uh, wealthy and talented people away from your country. So I had written this piece back in 2019 for the New York Times on the happy capitalists of Switzerland. And in the new book coming out this June, I further expand on that to show that if there's any place where capitalism is still working, it's in the heart of Europe and that's a place like Switzerland. And even in some of the countries uh, which are held as models uh, of uh, democratic socialism, such as Sweden, it's very interesting to see the trends, which is that after a lot of runaway government spending there uh, since the early 90s when they had the crisis, they have pulled back. So a lot of the European success stories over the last two or three decades uh, has been about keeping government uh, intervention and government spending uh, to reasonable levels and not letting it spin out of control. So as I said, in some of the Nordic countries or in countries like Sweden, uh, government spending as a share of the economy has in fact declined. Uh, and then you have countries such as Switzerland where it's relatively low. Um, and so I think that, and then you have countries like Greece, uh, which were forced to reform because they had a crisis and uh, forced to rationalize. So I think that there are pockets of strength within Europe, and at an overall level, the government debt picture in particular in Europe looks relatively benign, especially compared to what exists today in America. Ruchi Sharma, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.